All right. So Jasmine is a UX research lead on a mission to help teams empathize more with the people and customers for which their products are tested and made for. Now, often as testers, we hear a lot about tools to put in our toolbox, things like you know, Jenkins and Cypress and Playwright. But here to introduce us to another tool called Empathy, I would like to welcome Jasmine Mayfield. Oh. Hi, everybody. <laughs> I sound a little bit quirky. Um, look, I thought it might be fun to start off with a bit of a guessing game for funsies. Um, and so just feel free to shout your answers out. Um, any answer is not a bad answer, it's a good answer. I have actually come prepared with chocolate as a prize for one special person. Uh, and the question is, who said this is going to change the world? This is actually a two-part question. Second part is, what are they referring to? Any ideas? Oh, this is a good one, but no, not that, not that one. Any other guesses? I'll give you a clue. Um, this product is a particularly famous one, the one I'm thinking of, um, that launched in 2001. That's the clue, if you can remember back that far. It's 2021. 21 years ago, I can't, I can't do maths. Um, drum roll please, the answer is Segway. Yeah, sorry, I forgot to do the drum roll, thank you. Um, Segway, um, does anybody remember these folks? There we go, there's a picture. Um, this is Dean Kamen, the inventor of Segway, um, and he said this is gonna change, um, going to change the world. I should probably refer back to my notes at this point. Um, Segway is, was known as the self-balancing human or personal transporter. Um, it promised to change cities and offer a solution to the very notorious last mile problem of connecting people from train stations and bus stops through to their offices and their homes. Um, it's just also just quite a funny piece of machinery to look at as well. It had um, three speeds, 10, 13, and 16 <coughs> kilometers per hour. It had a, um, had a grip handle for steering and you could control um, the forward and back motion by leaning into a foot pedal. Um, it was created uh, with just the utmost secrecy. It was very secret, squ secret squirrels type stuff. Um, and it was referred to as Project Ginger. Uh, Dean came and said, Segway will be to the car what the car was to the horse and buggy. So there's some pretty bold claims being made even before it was launched. Um, John Doe, a venture capitalist, said Segway would be more uh, important in invention than the internet. Um, early investor Jeff Bezos, revolutionary. Segway would be revolutionary, and Steve, um, Steve Jobs, as significant as the PC, he went on to predict that whole cities would redesign themselves uh, around the Segway. So let's just, there's a lot of static images here. Here's one uh, of a Segway in motion. <laughs> um, and you know, this just kind of screams to me, people who want to, you know, who use Segway are not afraid to embarrass themselves in public. A um, hundred uh, hundred thousand sales were projected for year one. However, over its 19 year um, lifespan, only 140k units were sold. Um, so it's probably safe to say that the Segway revolution didn't succeed. Uh, it was a failure. Um, so what can we learn from this? I think there's a few things. Firstly, uh, the Segway is heavy. It's actually really hard to use by nature of those big wheels. Um, secondly, it offered very few um, practicalities over, say, a car, a bike, or a scooter. Um, and thirdly, it was just too expensive for its time, going at 5K a pop <coughs> USD back in 2001 when it launched. Um, and that was the cost for what you would pay for a pretty decent, good-used um, car. Um, it also suffered headlines like this, um, dorky, <laughs> um, but unfortunate. Um, and it didn't help with really high profile Segway accidents. Um, kabush, 
Um, here he is in 2003, he's on the driveway outside of his parents' home and he's had a bit of a collision and has gone down. Um, and this has um, happened just after, ironically, he received a letter on how to use it. Uh, Segway took to Hollywood. Um, this is Paul Blatt Mall Cop. I'm not sure if it's one or two. Um, I actually really like Paul Blatt Mall Cop, <laughs> one and two, and I'm quite excited. I think there might even be a third one, um, as per my research preparing for this talk. Um, and I love it because it's just really funny. I love watching it with the kids. And I think that's probably um, the problem here is that Segway kind of got itself into this corner where it became entertainment and didn't really um, wasn't taken seriously enough as a product. Um, in terms of a very, very small uptake, you know, it was really just sort of tourism operators and law enforcement at the end of the day. Sales were really poop. Um, they only met 1% of their projected sales targets. Um, and the first 6,000 units um, were recalled due to a safety issue, um, which is just a real shame. Um, there was a software glitch with the battery, which meant that it would just stop just at random, um, causing, causing the, um, the rider to like dangerously fall to the ground. So quite dangerous in some respects, depending on where you are like on a road. Um, and then a further and final, I guess, KO knockout happened in um, 2009, I think it was. Um, so Segway was sold the year before to um, this chap, James Heseldon, very tragically, uh, in an accident drove a Segway off a cliff. So ultimately Segway failed. Um, and it, I think it failed because its biggest issue was that um, it didn't fit into modern society. Um, it wasn't practical enough to replace a car to go on long distance journeys. It wasn't safe, cheap or convenient enough for short ones. Um, and really, to strip it all back, it lacked a clear purpose and a clear target audience. Um, kia ora katoa katoa, talofa, uh, ni hao, uh, ciao, bonjour, hi, um, I'm Jazz. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here with you. It was a little bit tentative, um, I must say, <laughs> this week. Um, it's such a, a cool novel thing to also just be at an in-person conference in these really wild times. And um, as Aaron said, I'm a UX researcher. I work locally here in Wellington. I love, I div, dig anything user research. Um, in my work, I'm uh, really, I guess, interested in the intersection between technology and humans. Um, and arguably, I feel like I'm, I might be a little bit of an anomaly in terms of the, the flying lineup of speakers and, and people here today. And I hope to just offer up perhaps something a little bit different um, for you all. So, huh, I don't know why I'm really puffed. Um, I'm here to talk about a few things. One of them is um, why products fail. Um, and in Segway's case, they probably had a bunch of assumptions that what they were doing was so revolutionary. You know, everybody would just get it once they rode one. Um, in terms of the system requirements, they more or less met those system requirements pretty much bang to a T. But this is the big question here. Who tested that the system requirements actually met real customer needs. We waste billions of dollars each year on preventable, preventable mistakes. This is from uh, Norman Nielsen Group from their paper, UX Metrics and ROI, um, published in 2000. They kind of do these sporadically from time to time. Um, and this is true, there is a real cost to the bottom line when we don't do things right. Um, it's not just about money though, of course, it's also about our time and our energy, and energy is just so important, right? Like, who has enough energy these days? <laughs> um, so why do we fail? Um, and this is what I want to have a look at today, and what can we do as testers and, and researchers and people in UX and just general people who work on product um, do about it? The answer is simple. Um, it's not only about uh, testing the thing right, following good practice, ensuring good test coverage, all of those important things. It's also about um, testing the right thing. And this might seem really mighty obvious to us, but it can actually be quite tricky to figure out what is the right thing to test. And here's how. Software often fails because it doesn't contemplate the user's needs in the context of their actual use. 
gifts are really fun, aren't they? And those are really fun. And the IEEE issued a report in 2005 stating the top 12 reasons why software fails, um, ranging from unmanaged risks to stakeholder politics, kind of everything in between. There's quite a lot going on there. Um, I'm really only going to focus on this one here in pink, poor communication um, of customer needs. I'll also talk a little bit briefly to badly defined system requirements, just because I think sometimes they can be interpreted as same same, but they're actually quite different. Um, and to use the example of Segway, um, we could say, as an example, the customer, customer need there may have been a futuristic self-balancing robot to get someone around town. Um, and then on the other hand, the system's requirements uh, were a two-wheeled robot utilizing self-balancing algorithms to fit the width of a, a standard US sidewalk, something like that. The problem is whether that customer need ever really existed in the first place. <clears throat> um, and I think a large part of where things go wrong is with the communication. Um, communication is so important, it's so vital, and we get it wrong all the time. Like it's really hard to communicate, <clears throat> communicate stuff. Stuff just falls through the cracks. Often a product idea um, comes from someone who Actually, they did really understand the user need and the requirements and all of the pain points and the desires. They actually got that really well. But by nature of actually moving through the process of communicating those customer needs from person to person to person to other person in the product team, um, for it then the, all of those needs to be kind of exposed to different technology options, for all of those needs to then be squeezed through an MVP filter, for us to then write kind of functional specs against it. Um, the pains and the desires of the customer get lost in the noise and it becomes more about the product and actually less about the real people um, that it's for in the context in which they'll be using it. And I think the product management swing is a really good one. Um, meme is a good one. Um, it's an oldie, but a gold. I really love it. It sort of shows how communication can kind of break down across all of our um, different units, units, functions. Um, and, you know, it's, it's very sarcastic, but there's a lot, of, um, a lot of sad truth in here. Communication can go wrong. Um, it can be really tempting to jump in and start building the thing right based on our own assumptions, we all have them based on whatever experience we have with different tech stacks. But there is a real danger when we don't have those conversations and we don't communicate them around the customer need across all of the parties. Um, so how do we know that we're actually testing the right thing? Um, and so just four things I'm gonna run through, hopefully very quickly with you today. Um, these four things that you can see up here um, by no means, this is not an exhaustive list. There's actually, there's quite a few more um, that I haven't included. This is not a framework. This is just simply a bunch of things that Jazz has, um, has picked up along um, the way. So the first one, user research. User research can be the communication point um, between customer needs and system requirements. Let's talk about it in context of a, a typical product setting. So in a typical product setting, you have a researcher who does their research, who gets those insights, and then brings them back to the team to communicate, or sometimes it's referred to as feed the team, feed the team the insights um, and, and pass on that knowledge. Um, and then you might have a, a PO or a BA or a development manager, really, it really depends on your organization, who then write the system requirements from there. So there's actually kind of two things going on here. Getting insights is just one, point, one part. There's actually really no part, no point in going out, doing those insights. You could be a really excellent researcher, but if there's no, if you can't communicate them and translate them back in a meaningful way into your product team so they can, I guess, be caught um, and understood, then it really is a waste of time. And I think this is where really communication just kind of fails for us. Um, and I think it fails kind of on, on, on both ends. There's kind of the need to throw and there's an expectation to catch. Um, and it's, it can be a bit tough. Um, there's a bunch of user research methods. I won't go into um, all of these today, but basically you just, um, you pick the method um, for the job at hand. Uh, and research methods can be 
um, broadly bucketed in, in, into these two groups, generative research, which is looking at um, a, a deeper understanding of the problem, um, tends to be a lot more kind of open, uh, as sometimes also referred to as exploratory or discovery research, and then you've got um, evaluative research, which tends to take more of an assessment type approach format. So um, a couple of examples might be POC testing or proof of concept testing, um, where you're actually you know, putting some actual things, a working prototype in the hands of a, of a potential customer, um, or you know, maybe even something a little bit more kind of small scale, perhaps testing out some, um, some content or copyright changes. Um, both are really valuable decision-making tools, um, but perhaps a good way of thinking about them is this, um, in questions, I like questions, <laughs> uh, this is uh, framed up by Erica Hall, who wrote Just Enough Research, really fantastic book. Um, it's one of those book apart books too, so it's like that thin, you can read it in, in a couple of hours. She runs a design agency in New York. Um, generative research, what problem might we solve versus uh, how well is our solution working? So a couple of things there. So what's the impact of doing research uh, in UX well? It's pretty good. Um, I think it's pretty good. Uh, so Dr. Susan Weinschink here is a um, behavioral psychologist uh, in her paper, Usability, a Business Case, reports that for every dollar that you invest into UX, you can expect $100 um, in return. And broadly speaking, this is because of increased customer loyalty and reduction in your development costs. On that note, oops, that slide's a little bit crooked. <laughs> Uh, she reports that investing upfront in UX can also lower the chances of your rework further downstream, um, which is a good thing. The cost of good UX adds up too. Uh, we've got a graph here. Um, what is this about? This uh, graph is comparing UX-driven design companies and the returns that they had um, over a 10-year period, so from 2005 to 2015, and those returns actually outperforming the S&P 500 index by 211%, just by putting emphasis on UX and really caring about what those customer needs are. It's pretty bizarre. Um, this is a, it's a little screenshot from the Design Management Institute. Um, this research was done in conjunction with Forrester, and you can see on the left-hand side um, the companies that we researched there. Next, we have the opportunity tree, um, and a bit of a disclaimer here, I'm not a product expert at all. Um, I am merely just a researcher who really digs this method, um, this method or this framework, actually, um, by Teresa Torres, opportunity solution tree. So what is it? Why do I like it? I think I really like it because it reminds me a bit of a family tree <laughs> or a site map. Uh, and basically you have these opportunities that you can see in green, kind of in that middle layer there, and they all bubble up to a desired outcome at the top. Um, sometimes might refer to that as a mission. Um, and opportunities, is just another word of saying customer need. Um, they're based on data, and they're based on research. And then in the pink we have solutions, and solutions are just a way to solve for an opportunity. Um, and you sort of start to see this kind of nested like family tree kind of lineage come through. Um, so solutions should always ideally solve for an opportunity. And then underneath you've got experiments. So we've got three solutions here, which um, are supposed to solve for this far left opportunity. And then underneath here, a bunch of experiments. And experiments are exactly what it says on the can, ways to experiment, test, measure, compare, how much you're actually moving the needle for your mission. Um, the really great thing about opportunity tree, I find, is that it really helps me, like it keeps me in check because we're all human at the end of the day and it can be very easy to start burrowing down deep in, into a solution and next thing you, you kind of get a bit carried away. Um, and just through this really sort of simple visual representation, you can see that everything has its place, everything is in context. And so you minimize the risk that you're working on a solution that's over here and it doesn't actually connect up to a customer need. So that's, that's a really good one. Um, and then just one last thing here, uh, 
and I haven't, I haven't actually used this myself, <laughs> uh, but I would like to give it a go. Um, this could be a really interesting framework to help um, negotiate curveballs. Sometimes curveballs come in. Um, and the reason why I say that is I think you can catch that curveball and you can chuck it up here and you can sort of lay it out in context and see how does that curveball actually relate, position, prioritise against what we already, what our already identified opportunities are. Um, of course, that really depends on where you work, how you prioritise, who prioritises, um, who ultimately makes decisions at the end of the day. Um, there's lots more to say about the opportunity tree. I'm a real big fan. Um, happy to speak to anybody about it in the break. Uh, Teresa Torres has recently uh, released a book on this called Continuous Discovery Habits last year. Fully recommend. Customer sessions. Um, customer sessions are like my favourite thing to do. Um, and I just think there is so much value in doing either running a customer session or just showing up and watching a customer session um, in terms of really trying to understand what those customer needs are. Um, and recently I just had the loveliest of yarns um, to a, a tester and we were reflecting on five years ago. We were in a cab, we were on our way to a customer session at Newtown and they turned to me and they said, Jazz, you know what? I've never ever spoken to a customer. I've been doing testing for 21 years. And I just thought, wow, tell me what you think afterwards. Um, and so like, I might just read some of this stuff out because it really is too good. Um, so this person went along, watched the customer session, um, and then kind of after the fact, uh, the takeaways were it's about building quality. All of a sudden, as a tester, it's not about finding bugs or technical system issues. I'm trying to figure out how we can make their lives easy. It made me think I'm not just here to hunt bugs, but actually solve problems. Um, this was a real game changer moment for this person. And for me, kind of hearing this feedback back, um, I won't dive into this, there's a lot of words on the screen here, but this is some kind of tangibles and specifics with regards to tabs, what they were observing, how that particular customer was interacting with the thing. Um, there's also a mention about a tablet, which was really, really, really kind of eye-opening for us um, during that customer session, because we, we really hadn't, that was not on our radar at all, that was a bit of a gotcha moment. And a, a pretty good takeaway for us. Um, and so really the takeaway here is that as makers of product, testers, whatever your role may be, we are not our customer. We are not, 99% of the time, we are not our customer. And there is real value in stepping away from the monitor and getting out there on the ground and attending a session like this. This stuff might seem really granular, maybe a little bit cryptic as well. Um, but this stuff really is my bread and butter as a researcher and I just want to share these very quickly as some tips if you are someone who is considering, you know, actually trying to explore what customer needs are um, and attending a session. So um, the first one, just do it in the words of Nike. You know, if you're on the fence, just get in there, get amongst it, come along to a session. I guarantee you any researcher or facilitator who's running this would absolutely love for you to come along. Um, generally, we say no more than two observers per session because sometimes it can be a bit off-putting, like, you know, you have that kind of grandstand effect and we, we don't really want to freak the people out that we're going to go meet. So, um, so two observers, um, sessions usually run for about an hour. There's usually a debrief afterwards. I would recommend um, showing up in person or attending remotely if it's uh, remotely formatted. Um, way better than just watching a recording after the fact. There's something really um, quite powerful about being there in the moment and actually being present. So just do it. And the second one, zip it in eyes. <laughs> this one here is just about you. If you, you come along, you can just sit back and relax. You don't have to. Um, don't have to necessarily talk to the customer at all. You can just observe and listen, perhaps even take some notes. Um, bear in mind that whoever is facilitating that session, there's a bit of a process to get us towards that session. That whole conversation has been very carefully curated. That conversation has been designed. It bubbles back to our research goals and so forth. So don't worry. 
Um, if you have any questions, like we really love questions, we really invite them, we want you to kind of engage with customers. At the end, we always ensure that there's some time for you to, um, to ask them. So do that. Uh, number three, minimum of two. This is really to uh, counter balance any potential confirmation bias, which happens a lot. Um, uh, and confirmation bias uh, is something like you might have a very kind of strong idea on how a customer might think or what they say or how even they might even behave in a session. And if you go along and you see that happen in the session, you're more likely to think, ah, I was right. But to bring it back to user research, it's all about being really open, right? Um, and to even like strip it back to like segue, I think that's, that's really important. We must always remain really open. Um, and so just simply going along to more than one session will help balance that out. Uh, four, keep with the flow. Keep the flow. This one's very specific. It is if uh, you are attending a session in person with a laptop and you're typing notes on your laptop, can actually be quite loud and can be quite off-putting to people as well. And participants really lean into, or they, like they read into the silence. So if they're talking, they stop talking, you stop tapping, it goes quiet, like it's awkward. And then they start to feel, oh, did I say the wrong thing? And it can really kind of derail your session. So just keep the flow going, keep, keep typing your notes. You can always go back and read whatever funny note you wrote yourself at the end of the session. Um, number five, not testing. Uh, so we use the term user testing, usability testing, test, 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 test <laughs> all the time, um, which is great for internal. Um, when you are uh, in the presence of a participant or a customer, try not to use that. You can use things like sessions, um, chats, hangs, just keep it a lot more kind of generic. Um, it might seem like really kind of obsessive uh, <laughs> here. But if you happen to be up against a participant who's never done any sort of feedback before, um, it can really, kind of two things, they can really feel like they are being tested. Um, and that can go in two different ways. One, they can start to just shut down completely. I have had this happen with me, with a barrister in, Christ, um, barrister in um, Christchurch, and it takes a lot of energy to then put, your, um, put yourself back on track. Um, the other direction that they'll go is then they'll overcompensate and they'll end up telling you things that they think you want to hear and it kind of just, um, you have to kind of throw that session out. Lastly, sharing is caring, uh, in the words of my six-year-old. So whatever um, is interesting to you, share those, share those top takeaways um, and stand up the next day. Um, I'll just fly through these really quickly. These are some examples that perhaps could have been mitigated um, through the the use of usability sessions. Um, again, repeat takeaway here, we're not our customer. The average person doesn't probably know or really care about regular expressions. Um, so just, just use plain language. Um, and here we've got some, um, some test data leaking through production. Um, bit of an oops, oopsies do happen. Um, I wanted to just touch on the QA shift left philosophy. Um, and this is about bringing my understanding, QA conversations um, uh, earlier into the process and throughout the process. So they're a lot more present and a lot more kind of easier to tackle through the likes of QA kickoffs. Um, this is from Atlassian. Um, this is their, their model, their thing. Um, QA kickoffs and QA demos as opposed to QA just being right at the end and being a bottleneck to, um, to delivery. Uh, and as a researcher, I am, I am all for this. I think this is a real wow fact move uh, in terms of communication and collaboration and bringing in those very needed, very valued conversations a lot more upstream. And if I can throw out a thought to you, keep shifting left until you can't shift left no more, la 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 la, um, and shift left and come and do some user, um, usability sessions with us so you can understand those customer needs and really connect them back to the system requirements. Uh, empathy, my pal, um, empathy underpins really absolutely everything. It's the most important and first step in the design thinking process. Um, empathy is about showing up understanding, listening, caring, giving a shit. Um, it's not about um, 
feeling sorry for someone, it's not about being compliant or kind of agreeing, for someone, agreeing with someone for the sake of it, it's actually walking in somebody else's shoes. Um, in my view, this might be a bit naive, I honestly think that empathy has the possibility to change the world. If you think about empathy in terms of leadership, governments, communities, societies as a whole, empathies in situations of crisis, I think it's mind-blowing um, and a really fascinating topic. Bringing it back though <laughs> to research, um, it really is everything. It, it acts as a wrapper to everything that we do in our research and understand customer needs. Um, and in many respects, at the end of the day, good UX is good business, right? Um, understanding customer needs is going to increase your chances of higher ROI, it's going to reduce your time spent on rework, um, and it means you're going to really put your energy into the things that really matter. Customer loyalty, creating more customer loyalty and stickiness. Um, as the Oracle Google says, focus on the user and all else will follow. This is rule number one of their 10 things. They have a 10 things philosophy. It's like a 10 commandments sort of, sort of thing. Uh, I'm all for this. Focus on your user, understand their customer needs, apply your empathy, um, and give a customer a session to go. You've got nothing to lose. Uh, so in conclusion, building a great product, I think, takes, yes, absolutely a great implementation team, but equally it takes a really strong design intention that's rooted um, in a real customer need. Uh, and the risk of not having that customer need, not knowing that customer need, means that you might run really, 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 really fast with really fantastic form, but you run the risk of running in the wrong direction and not hitting the mark, is what Segway did. Um, some of you might know this quote, it's by Albert Einstein. Uh, if I were given one hour to save the planet, I would spend 59 minutes to find a problem, one minute resolving it. Um, and in the spirit of Einstein, here's a quote by Jasmine Mayfield, never ever heard before by anybody. <laughs> if I had an hour to ensure that a product is on a winning track, I would spend 59 minutes understanding the customer need in one minute, clearly communicating it. Um, thank you so much. Um, I just want to say a very special thank you to Aaron for helping me with all my technical things um, this week, um, to Fabio Amor, um, <laughs> to Cammy Cam uh, as well. It's been a real honour um, to you all here in the audience um, and to my works, Trove and Forsyth Bar, and to the team there. Thank you so much for your support.